Um, thanks, Andy. Um, okay, uh, can everyone please stand up? And can everyone please give the person next to them a massive hug? Okay, you can sit down now. Um, right, okay, we, we can carry this on later on. Anyway, um, hello everybody, uh, my name's Gav. Uh, it, it says up here I'm a corporate pirate, and I'll tell you about, a bit more about that in a second. Um, th this talk very nearly didn't happen um, for three reasons. First is Andy just mentioned that I have got a, I fractured my shoulder quite badly skiing a few weeks ago. I'm meant to be in the hospital having operations, but I didn't want to. I wanted to come here instead. Um, secondly, and a little bit more seriously, I was told a few years ago by some doctors that there was a good chance I would never speak again, and I wasn't ever going to be able to talk. And hence, the, the gift of being able to talk to you today means a lot to me. And again, a bit more about that in a minute. Um, and thirdly, this reason, the only reason this talk happened was I was here last year, and on the last night, I got drunk with uh, David, his uh, old friends and ex-colleagues, uh, and he said, how has it been for you? And I said, yeah, it's been great. It's amazing. I loved it. But I, I'm a bit worried because I come from a corporate world. I think everyone thinks I'm a bit of a wanker. Um, <laughs> and he kind of rolled his eyes and went, no, it's not from your corporate world, mate. But, um, <laughs> but you keep thinking that, think that if you want. And he said, why don't you come back next year and tell them why or show them or maybe explain to them why perhaps you're not a wanker. Um, you can work out for yourself later on if I am or not, and uh, there's a clue, which you'll, which you'll see in a minute. Which, um, okay, so a little bit about me, a little bit about what I've done, and then, uh, and then hopefully just a couple of kind of messages and ideas will come out of that. Um, I, I, I was a very, very happy kid. I loved stroking cows. Um, my dad was a vet, which is probably why I was surrounded by animals all the time. Uh, but life was, life was good. Uh, I did, when I was growing up, though, start to realise that perhaps by kind of bending the rules a bit and, and being a little bit of a maverick, you could potentially get a few more things done. And that was a theme that I developed in later life. Um, my first job was at a big pet food company where I walked in on the first day and there was a, there was a dustbin, I, I kid you not, full of birdseed. They'd just done a trial. And they, the, with no sense of irony, they gave me the dustbin full of birdseed, a pair of tweezers, and said, your job for the next six weeks is to go through this dustbin with the tweezers and, and sift out the two different types of birdseed. I was like, you're joking, aren't you? I said, no, that's your job. The next day I came to work and I developed a strange bird allergy, which uh, I'm told doesn't exist in real life, but I said, I'd love this job, but I have a bird allergy, I can't do it. And I got moved to the puppy unit where I played with puppies for six weeks, so it was a, a different gig. But I learned very quickly that just being a little bit uh, cheeky and bending the rules can be quite fun. Um, and then went off to university. You can't really see this photo, but what you, if you could see it closely, you'd see there's me there. Uh, this is graduation function. And every single other person in the picture, apart from six people, are women. Um, I went to a girls' college, which was fantastic. Um, uh, and again, it was just kind of funny being the guy at this college that was actually girls' college studying education and drama. It was all a kind of mishmash. And again, this sort of theme of just trying to be a little bit confusing people, not being put in, the, in a certain box was something that I thought was kind of fun. I then worked in advertising for quite a long time, 13 years. Um, the peak of my career was working on this little ad, which you may recognise as a Guinness ad. Very proud of it. Still being voted the best ad of all time. Um, it's great. Uh, and I also worked with David um, on some less famous ads. We were trying to work out last night on an ad that we'd worked on. We neither of us could remember one of them, so that's probably not great. Um, but advertising was good, and it was good to me, and I had a lot of fun, and I, I, you know, I was lucky enough to work with some great, great people. Uh, I then uh, got married. Um, to a lovely South African lady, and uh, life, was, life was absolutely fantastic. I, I, I was kind of, you know, blessed and possibly spoiled and indulged, but life was really good. And I was in my early 30s and thought, what, what's, what, you know, it's fantastic. But there's a bit of what next, what's going to happen, where's it going? You know, I'd achieved a lot early on, uh, and, and then some stuff really did happen. And so in the period of four years, um, some, some crazy stuff happened. So I... I I quit my career. I decided advertising wasn't for me. I kind of thought I'd achieved a lot in it. I wanted to go and do something else. Didn't know what, but I walked out of my job, which was a silly but brave thing to do. Um, I became a dad. I, I have two kids who uh, was my proudest achievement, really, is becoming a father, and I, I, it's fantastic. I'd urge anyone to try it. Um, and, then, and then I got a bit of a, bit of a bum steer, actually. I got, uh, I got cancer. Um, 
I got tongue cancer, uh, and the doctors had to cut out half of my tongue and rebuild it out of my arm, of which there's some good stories and scars, which I can show you later in the bar. But um, that was unpleasant, obviously, and, and being told not to, I wasn't going to potentially be able to speak again, obviously think I might die. And for about three or four months, I couldn't speak, and I was in, in hospital, and I, I was concerned that, given I like talking, shit, um, uh, it was going to be, you know, it's going to be quite a hard thing to deal with. And, and the currency of ideas, as we know, is, is chat and discussion and sharing them. And I was kind of like, if I can't speak, I can't do my job. Um, not that I had a job at the time, but um, uh, and then I got divorced, um, uh, and, and my kids and wife moved back to South Africa. So I was kind of, it all it had been great, and suddenly it all went a bit kind of uh, tits up. But like any sort of bad steer in life, you have to take your lessons and you have to learn from them. And I learned some stuff, some important stuff, which I want to kind of share with you today. I learned that you, your mortality is only just around the corner. So you, you know, we, you, when you're young and in your 30s and relatively healthy, you think you're invincible and immortal, but you, we're not, and I wasn't. And it's important to, to, to know that you know, you're only you know, one move away from your epitaph. Time's important. We all think times are a luxury. Uh, time is, is highly, really important. And again, this idea that I used to do, I'm the world's greatest procrastinator. I won't do it today, I'll do it tomorrow. Um, and I learned through the cancer experience and also my kids moving away, I only see them a few times a year now, that actually time with them is really precious. And, and words and speech and ideas, I, I, I realised that actually what I'd taken for granted, the ability to talk nonsense about anything, was, was actually a genuine gift, although not everyone would agree with that. Um, and then what happened is I got a call one day, I was unemployed to, from O2, saying, do I want to go and, and work in the run brand strategy for O2 and, and work for them? And I was like, wow, that's great. I respect you as a company, but you're a big corporate. Well, you're not going to like me. I'm a bit of a, I'm, a, you know, I'm an idiot. Um, and, and I remember the week before I went to O2, I, this was just a photo that was taken, which just summed up how much of an idiot I am. Uh, and I was like, how, how am I going to work at O2? I've got these ideas, and they're going to think, I'm going to wear a suit, and it's in slough, and it's just not going to work. And actually, I, I, I mean, I obviously, I did go there, and I realised, actually, the, the ability to, to, to share ideas and make ideas grow in a big corporate with huge, huge budgets and huge customer base actually could be far more powerful than working at a agency in Soho. Um, I then discovered a book by a chap called Adam Morgan, who I'm sure some of you have, have, have heard of, called The Pirate Inside. When that became my philosophy, I was very lucky I found that book, and the philosophy of the book is be, be the maverick, be the pirate in a big organisation, and that's a really powerful position to be in because with all the scale and effect that co co com companies have on society and customers, actually you can do some amazing stuff. The first great idea I had at O2, I went to a conference, not dissimilar from this, but in San Francisco, not in a tent, so quite different, um, and I had an idea. And I, an idea was for a new uh, mobile phone company that was going to be run by its members. So not run by the corporate, run by the members. Um, and that was, um, that was kind of, at the time, quite a big idea. It was four years ago, pre sort of Web 2.0. But it was like it was a Wikipedia meets a mobile phone company. And I scribbled the idea back in the back of my book, and this is the idea in the back of the book. And there was a couple of quite interesting things. Pay what you want, which I thought was, my bosses didn't really go with that. But, um, and this kind of profit share, we'll give 20% of the profits back to the customers. And this is probably the most important bit, which was invite customers to get involved in running the company. Um, so I came back to London, or to Slough, and, and this idea of being mutual, it was all about being mutual. I thought it was great to call it 2-0. They thought it was a really crap name. But, um, so I came back, and we, we, uh, I, we, over a period of time, with some help from some other colleagues, we, we launched a thing called GIFGAF. GIFGAF is a word that means a mutual gift. Um, and the idea is that it's a network, it's, uh, it's run by the, by the members. So the members do all the marketing, they do all the customer service, and we pay them. And it's, it's a big, joy, happy family. Um, uh, it's done really well. It was voted brand of the year last year. Uh, it's, done, it's done extremely well. And the reason it's done well is it's because it's about community, that people sharing an idea about a different kind of mobile phone network, and they run it, they do it, and it's fantastically successful. Um, it has the highest community engagement score in the world, based on all the measures. Paid out about a million pounds so far to the members to say thank you for them helping run the company. And, and one chap last year earned 17 grand just by kind of doing what he do anyway, by being in his bedroom answering questions about mobile phones and getting his mates to sign up. And he's now paying for himself to go to the university on the back of being a gift gaff customer, really. So that's a kind of new way of doing things. My second kind of big idea, I also had at a talk, a TED talk a few years ago. Um, so I guess there's a story in this, which is ideas will come at the back of this process. Uh, and I'm, I met, and you can't really see him there, a chap called Emmanuel Jal. I urge you to see his talk on TED. It's, it's fantastic. Um, he... Um, 
He's an ex-Sudanese child soldier. So he was a guerrilla soldier in Sudan. He was picked up by the guerrillas, trained how to kill people. He spent a lot of his time killing people. He then got rescued by a British aid worker, Emma McLean at the top there, came to the UK, and he now is a massive um, peace activist. He, he raps for peace, um, and he did a talk at TED, and, and the gist of the talk was, we as Africa don't want your sympathy, we don't want your pity, we don't want your money. We want you to help us get a great education. That's the greatest gift you could give any human being as an education. And I came out of this talk as an ex... I trained to be a teacher at university. Uh, and I was like, wow, that's amazing. I want to do something with that. What can I do? And I remember that when I was training to be a teacher, every teacher I met had this great lesson inside of them. And the best ones had hundreds and thousands. But every teacher you met, you'd see them one day give this lesson to the kids and they'd come alive like they were performing Hamlet. And it was like, wow, that's amazing. What I want, and the idea was, very simple idea, get all those lessons, film them, put them somewhere on the internet, and then any kid in the world could watch those lessons and have access to a great education. Um, again, my very generous bosses said they'd support me with this. So we launched a thing called O2Learn. It's, we, we want to make it Britain's biggest classroom. You've seen the things on your chairs. Um, there's a little cartoon um, by an ex-do lecturer, Tom, who I met last year at the do. Uh, and I'm going to show you a quick little film that will just give you a bit more context to it. Think of this simply as the power of water hitting the cliff. Um, so we only launched it uh, last year. Um, it, it, we run it as a sort of not-for-profit um, enterprise, so there's no, there's no commercial. We're not trying to sell phones to kids or anything like that. Um, it's a simple website. I would urge any of you that know any teachers, please get them to put a lesson on there. They can, there's a chance they can win a lot of money. 